Also, see the Lily took a screen. Um, maybe I can share the screen. Okay. okay, dear colleagues, today we have a joint meeting of two seminars. The seminar in algebra and logic at the Department of, of Algebra and Logic at the University. Sorry, at the Institute of Mathematics and Informatics at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences, and a similar seminar. Uh, on analysis in geometry and topology, again at the Institute. And the speaker today, this is Professor Lumiora Kamenova from Stony Brook. Okay, she is Bulgarian. She was a winner in the International Olympiad uh, in mathematics with a silver medal. Uh, and she got a, a gold medal um, in the Balkan Olympiad of mathematics when she, uh, she was in the high school. Then she got um, bachelor and Masters at the University of Sofia and the PhD in MIT. Um, there she, she, um, she was a student of Tian and Tian was a student of Yao, so she is a grandchild in scientific um, um, kind from the great of the great Yao. Um, then she, she, she had a postdoc in Princeton and now she is in, in Stony Brook. And of course, it, it's a, a, a great pleasure for me that she is the speaker today. You see the title, Algebraic non hyperbology of Hypercare Manifold, please. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it is so nice to see uh, so many uh, familiar faces. So uh, let me start with some uh, introduction and definitions. Uh, so what is the hyperkeller manifold? Uh, the algebraic uh, version is that uh, it is an irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold. Uh, in other words, it is a compact uh, complex scalar manifold, uh, which is simply connected. So the first fundamental group is zero. Uh, and there is a unique uh, up to a constant uh, holomorphic uh, non-degenerate uh, two-form uh, sigma. So um, if you have such a form sigma, uh, it induces an isomorphism between the tangent and cotangent bundles uh, of the manifold. And um, <clears throat> the condition that there exists in everywhere non-degenerate uh, two-zero form uh, implies that the canonical bundle uh, is trivial. So in particular, uh, the first ring class of the manifold is zero. And uh, there is uh, Bogomolov's uh, decomposition theorem, uh, which says that uh, if you have first string class zero, uh, then the manifold decomposes as uh, product of irreducible blocks, which are uh, columbials, uh, hyperkellers, and uh, tori. And uh, so hyperkeller manifolds are building blocks of this uh, decomposition. So uh, let's just uh, uh, mention uh, K3 surfaces. Uh, ho irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifolds, or in other words, hyperkeller manifolds, are uh, higher dimensional analogs of K3 surfaces. Uh, and a K3 surface, uh, this is compact complex uh, surface with trivial uh, canonical bundle and the first Betty number uh, which uh, vanishes. And indeed, uh, by many results, uh, mostly SU, but with some corrections by Kulikov and Todorov, uh, every uh, K3 surface is scalar. And uh, also every K3 surface is simply connected uh, because um, uh, any two K3s are deformation equivalent to each other. So if you take a quartic in CP3 uh, as a complete intersection, um, it is simply connected. So then, every K3 surface is uh, simply connected. And uh, one can compute the Hodge diamond of uh, K3 surface. And indeed, uh, H20 is one dimensional. So indeed, uh, K3 surfaces are hyperkeller. And uh, moreover, these are the only uh, examples in complex dimension two. So for a while, um, people didn't know uh, higher dimensional examples of hyperkeller manifolds. Uh, 
uh, even uh, Bogomolov uh, conjectures that uh, there are no higher dimensional examples. Uh, but then Fujiki uh, and Bouville um, uh, introduced uh, higher dimensional examples of uh, hypercalers uh, in every uh, possible dimension. So, for example, if you take the Hilbert schemes of endpoints on a K3 surface, uh, then this is hypercalar. Uh, this is actually the desingularization of the symmetric uh, end product of a K3 surface. Uh, if you take a K3 surface, uh, cross itself um, n times, uh, and then you mod out by the symmetric uh, group of n letters, uh, this becomes a singular complex space. But then when you take a minimal resolution, <laughs> you get the Hilbert scheme. And uh, basically, um, for any Q2, you can think of it as um, you can have uh, any two points on the K3 surface. And uh, if uh, the two points are different, then this gives you a point on the Hilbert scheme of two points on Hilbert 2 of S. And then if the two points are the same, uh, basically you can think of it as uh, they uh, come together along some direction. And then uh, you can think of this uh, element in the Hilbert scheme as a double point plus a uh, direction in which they come together. So that's a kind of geometric way uh, to think about the Hilbert schemes. Otherwise, you can just think of it as a desingularization of the symmetric uh, end product. <laughs> then um, another uh, standard series of examples comes uh, if instead of taking a K3 surface, you take an abelian surface. Uh, then if you just take Hill Ben, um, it wouldn't be simply connected. And also it will have uh, many uh, holomorphic symplectic forms. Um, in order to fix this, you can just take, uh, let's take Hilb n plus one. Uh, then you have the Chow morphism to the symmetric product um, of uh, the abelian surface. And then you can, because it's an abelian surface, you can sum up the points uh, and you take the summation map to uh, the abelian surface. Now, uh, if you take a distinguished point on the abelian surface and you call this the zero point, then you can take the fiber over the zero point inside of the Hilbert scheme uh, Hilben plus one of A. And this will be uh, also a hypercalar um, variety. It will be simply connected and there will be a, new, a unique uh, holomorphic symplectic form. So this was uh, Bouville's idea in uh, 82, and then his paper got published in 83. And uh, these are the two standard uh, examples of hypercalers, which occur in every uh, dimension, uh, complex dimension divisible by two, or real dimension divisible by four. For a while, uh, these were the only uh, two examples. Uh, but then O'Grady uh, introduced uh, two more examples, uh, which come as uh, the singularizations of morphology spaces of semi-stable sheaves. Uh, but these were very, um, these are very complicated to describe. Although now there are simpler ways uh, to think about them, so um, I'm not going to talk about them much. But uh, <clears throat> they're in complex dimensions six and ten. So um, if you take a K3 surface, um, if it's fibered over a smaller uh, manifold, then it has to be a complex curve or Riemannian surface. Um, then the only vibration that, occur that occurs is uh, elliptic uh, K3 surfaces. The base has to be uh, the complex projective uh, space CP1, and the general fiber is elliptic curve, and there are some singular fibers, uh, which are the generations of um, elliptic curves. So something very similar <laughs> happens in the higher dimensions. If you have a vibration uh, from a hypercalar manifold uh, to a smaller base, 
which means it's a proper surjective map with connected fibers. Then the dimension of the base is precisely half of the dimension of the total space. And the general fiber is a abelian variety, which is Lagrangian with respect to the holomorphic uh, 2 0 form. Uh, this means that the, if you take the holomorphic 2 0 form and restrict it to the general fiber, uh, then you get zero. So, um, <clears throat> vibration structures on hypercalar manifolds are very restrictive. They all look like this. Uh, the base is half of the dimension uh, and the general fiber is uh, a billion variety. Uh, and of course, there's some singular fibers which are uh, the generations of a billion varieties. And moreover, if you assume that the base is smooth, uh, then Huang proved that uh, the base is the complex projective space uh, CPN. Uh, which is also very, uh, very unique to hypercalar manifolds. <laughs> uh, there is also a uh, generalization of the intersection pairing on K3 surfaces. Uh, so if you take an element, um, uh, two elements in H2 uh, of the hypercalar, uh, if you pair them together, you get an element in H4. Uh, but you, if you want to get a number, you have to keep pairing it with the holomorphic symplectic form and it's a complex conjugate. So um, basically that's the idea of the uh, Bouville Bogomolov uh, Fujiki form. And um, uh, once uh, you define it properly, uh, it defines a non-degenerate uh, integral form on H2, which is the signature uh, three, and then the remaining uh, B2 minus three uh, of the, uh, where B2 is the second Betty number. So it's very similar to the case of K3 surfaces, because if you have a K3 surface, then the intersection pairing on H2 is the signature 3, uh, 19. So this is a very nice uh, generalization, and it satisfies Fujiki's relation, which means that the top pairing uh, of uh, any class in H2 is a constant, which is a positive constant, uh, times uh, this uh, form Q of alpha to the n. So this is very nice uh, equality to keep in mind. So here is a trivial observation. Um, if you take a uh, Lagrangian vibration, and you take an ample class on the base, uh, let's assume the base is smooth, so the base is CPN. Then the pullback of this ample class uh, is NEF. And moreover, uh, the bouville bogomolov fujiki form of this form uh, vanishes. Uh, that's uh, basically because um, if you take an ample class, um, let's take a hyperplane section on the base CPN, then if you pull it back and intersect it uh, n times, you get the class of a fiber. So if you take uh, the intersection one more time, you get zero. And uh, therefore, from uh, the previous slide, from Fujiki's formula, uh, this part will be zero, but then the constant is positive. So Q of alpha must be zero. So, uh, once you get a vibration, this observation is very uh, trivial. But then uh, we have a non-trivial uh, SYZ conjecture where SYZ uh, stands for Strominger uh, Yao Zaslo, uh, which says that the, uh, the converse should also be true. If you have an F-line bundle on a hypercalar manifold with vanishing uh, bouville bogomolo form, then uh, this netline bundle induces a Lagrangian vibration as in this observation. And this is highly non-trivial uh, conjecture, which uh, only recently in the last 10 years, uh, it was proved for the non-deformations of uh, hypercalers, for Hilbert schemes of K3 surfaces, <clears throat> for uh, the generalized uh, Kummer varieties, 
And uh, for O'Grady's uh, six-dimensional example, uh, right now Mongardian and Rappagneta are uh, working on the 10-dimensional example as well. So uh, soon I think they will prove it. Uh, so then uh, this conjecture should be known for all of the examples of hypercalers uh, that we have uh, so far. So uh, this is a very useful conjecture, so let's keep it in mind uh, because we'll need it uh, later. Basically, if you have a line bundle, uh, let's assume it's NEF, with vanishing uh, square with respect to the bouville bogmola form, then uh, it induces a Lagrangian vibration. Okay, so now let's switch to a little bit more uh, geometric um, parts. Uh, so, uh, what is the Kobayashi pseudometric on a manifold on a, or a complex space? Uh, this is uh, the maximal pseudo distance such that uh, all holomorphic maps from the unit disk with the Poincare metric with um, uh, towards um, M with this uh, pseudo metric are distance decreasing. So uh, why is it called a pseudometric? Um, it's a pseudometric because uh, you can measure the distance between uh, two points and it can happen that the distance between uh, two different points on the same manifold uh, is zero. Uh, that's why it's a pseudometric. Sometimes uh, that happens. And uh, the manifold is called uh, Kobayashi hyperbolic if uh, this dm is a metric. So uh, if uh, the distance between any two different points uh, is positive. And uh, Brody's theorem uh, concerns uh, compact complex manifolds. Uh, he gives a characterization in terms of uh, entire curves. So uh, M, which is a compact complex manifold, is Kobayashi non-hyperbolic uh, if and only if there exists an entire curve from C to M. Uh, this means that this is a non-trivial uh, holomorphic map from C to M. Uh, this means it doesn't map to one point, but the image uh, consists of uh, an actual curve. It, it can be singular, it can have self-intersections, um, <clears throat> But uh, as long as the image is not one point, uh, such an image is called an entire curve. So basically, if you have uh, rational or elliptic curves on your manifold, then it's automatically uh, Kobayashi non-hyperbolic. And uh, we are going to be interested in Kobayashi uh, non-hyperbolic uh, manifolds. Okay, in uh, 76, uh, Kobayashi made the following uh, conjectures. Uh, for a K3 surface, uh, we have that the Kobayashi pseudo distance is identically zero. And he did uh, the same conjectures for Calabi outs. Uh, but we're going to uh, prove them for hypercalers because uh, for uh, Calabi outs, it's uh, more difficult. Uh, for hypercalers, we know a lot about the moduli space and um, <clears throat> the period domain. Uh, so it, uh, hypercalar manifolds look more like uh, K3 surfaces. So we have more techniques um, for proving uh, these conjectures. And uh, a weaker conjecture is that uh, any hypercalar manifold is Kobayashi non-hyperbolic. Uh, uh, two implies uh, three. So uh, using some uh, older results uh, of Mori and Mokai, um, we have that the first conjecture holds for projective K3 surfaces uh, because um, <clears throat> projective K3 surfaces are uh, basically covered by uh, possibly singular uh, elliptic curves. Um, and uh, you have such families of uh, elliptic curves uh, going in all sorts of directions uh, once you have a projective K3 surface. So uh, basically you can uh, take any two different points 
on a K3 surface, uh, which is projective. And each one of them will lie on a, a possibly singular elliptic curve going in different directions. Um, and then uh, once they intersect, you can get the triangle inequality. You see that the distance between any two points uh, is less radial than the distance between uh, the first point and the intersection of these two, uh, let's say, elliptic curves, and then the intersection, plus the intersection, and then the other uh, point. Uh, but because uh, it's an elliptic curve, the Kobayashi pseudo metric on the elliptic curve is zero. So then you see that the distance between uh, any two points uh, is less radial than zero plus zero, so it must be uh, zero. So that's how you can think about uh, the first conjecture in case of uh, projective uh, K3 surfaces. Then, uh, much later, uh, with Verbitsky, we proved that uh, all of the known hyperkähler manifolds are Kobayashi non-hyperbolic. Uh, that's because uh, we proved that um, if you have the space of um, <coughs> the moduli space of hyperkähler manifolds, uh, then for the known examples, um, inside you have a density of Lagrangian vibrations. Um, just like elliptic K3 surfaces are dense in the moduli space of um, uh, K3 surfaces. Uh, similarly, um, hyperkellers that admit uh, Lagrangian vibrations are dense in the moduli space of uh, Lagrangian vibrations. And uh, once you have a Lagrangian vibration, uh, you have Kubayashi non hyperbolicity because um, the fibers are, uh, the general fiber is uh, abelian variety. Uh, and also <clears throat> the special fibers, uh, the ones that are the generations of uh, Lagrangian uh, of uh, abelian varieties, uh, some of them contain um, rational curves. So automatically they're Kubayashi non-hyperbolic. And uh, it's a different result of Brody, which says that uh, if you have a limit of Kubayashi non-hyperbolic manifolds, then um, you also get Kubayashi non-hyperbolicity. So uh, if you have density of uh, Lagrangian vibrations, then uh, automatically you get uh, non-hyperbolicity of uh, all of the points in the moduli space. So that's the idea behind this um, theorem. So uh, a little bit later, uh, Verbitsky extended this to all hyperkähler manifolds, not only the known uh, examples. And uh, we generalized uh, his result to a uh, vanishing of the Kobayashi pseudo metric. So together with Stephen Lu and uh, Misha Verbitsky, uh, we proved several uh, results. Uh, if you take any K3 surface, doesn't have to be a projective one, then uh, the Kobayashi pseudo distance vanishes. Then uh, if you have a hyperkähler manifold with uh, Picard rank less than maximal, uh, which is the formation equivalent to a Lagrangian vibration, uh, then the Kobayashi pseudo metric vanishes. And uh, then the question is what happens uh, in the case of maximal Picard rank? Uh, if you assume that the second Betty number is at least seven, and then you assume the Strominger Yal Zaslo conjecture holds for all the formations of M, then you can also deduce that the Kobayashi pseudo distance uh, vanishes. So uh, these are the main theorems about the Kobayashi pseudo metric. And uh, now let me also introduce uh, algebraic uh, non hyperbolicity. So uh, let's start with a Kobayashi hyperbolic manifold. And then uh, once you have a complex manifold, you have the associated uh, Hermitian metric with a corresponding uh, one one form. Then the conclusion is that there exists a positive constant such that for any non-constant holomorphic map from a smooth projective curve uh, to this complex manifold, 
uh, of genus G, we have the following inequality. Uh, 2G minus 2 is uh, greater or equal than this positive constant times, uh, and that's basically the degree of the curve with respect to uh, this uh, one one form uh, omega. So this is the integral over C uh, of the pullback of uh, omega. So in other words, um, the degree of any curve is bounded uh, from above by some linear uh, function of the genus. So um, you cannot have uh, degrees of curves which are uh, too big uh, with respect to the genus. So uh, this property uh, in the conclusion of the theorem is called uh, algebraic hyperbolicity. So basically the Marie uh, proved that um, Kobayashi hyperbolicity implies uh, algebraic hyperbolicity. And uh, then if you take the negation, is the opposite implication. So then algebraic non-hyperbolicity implies Kobayashi uh, non-hyperbolicity. But we have already proved some Kobayashi non-hyperbolicity results. So then a uh, stronger result would be uh, to prove uh, algebraic uh, non-hyperbolicity. So uh, then the next question is, um, are hypercalic uh, manifolds algebraically um, non-hyperbolic? And the answer is uh, yes, uh, but we can prove it in uh, some cases. So again, uh, take a hypercalic manifold with uh, Picard rank uh, rho. Uh, assume that either the Picard rank is strictly greater than two, or you have uh, Picard rank uh, precisely two, and the FYZ conjecture holds. Then uh, we can conclude that M is algebraically non-hyperbolic. And uh, the key theorem which we use uh, is uh, we basically look at the uh, automorphism groups and then uh, we have different cases as we'll see towards the end of the talk when we give a proof of this uh, theorem. Uh, but the key result um, is that uh, if you have a projective hyperkeller uh, manifold with infinite automorphism group, then um, M is algebraically uh, non-hyperbolic. <coughs> and uh, we generalized uh, this uh, key uh, theorem or key proposition uh, together with Bogomolov and Berbitsky. Uh, we just dropped the condition of hyperkeller. Uh, we have to use some different argument, <laughs> but um, if you have any projective uh, manifold with infinitely um, with, with infinite automorphism group, then uh, it cannot be algebraically hyperbolic. So then it's algebraically non-hyperbolic. So uh, let me go back to the definition of uh, <clears throat> algebraic hyperbolicity. So basically the idea is that um, uh, just let's take one automorphism of uh, infinite uh, degree. Then uh, if you keep acting on uh, such a curve uh, C with uh, infinite automorphism, then uh, after you act enough times, you can make the degree uh, of C with respect to this one one form infinitely high. So as high as you want. So it cannot be bounded by above by some linear function of the genus. So that's the idea behind uh, the theorem about infinite uh, automorphism group. Uh, of course, there are different cases. You can have uh, either infinite automorphism or you can have infinitely many uh, automorphisms of finite order. But uh, then you have to do some different arguments. Uh, but this is the main idea. Uh, behind the, the proof of this uh, key theorem. Okay, so now uh, let's set up uh, the proofs of uh, the various theorems. Uh, basically, the moduli space uh, to consider uh, is the Teich-Muller space of uh, complex structures, uh, of hyperkeller complex structures. And um, 
it looks uh, very much uh, like the Pachmiller space uh, for um, K3 surfaces. <laughs> so uh, the Pachmiller space, uh, this is this quotient of uh, the complex structures of hypercalate type, uh, modulo uh, connected uh, component of the diffeomorphism group. And uh, it admits an action by the mapping class group, um, gamma. And uh, if you have any uh, Calabria manifold M, then the Teich Miller space is uh, finite dimensional. This is the general result. Um, and then uh, if you take any element in the Teich Miller uh, space, uh, we call it uh, ergodic uh, if the orbit uh, is dense in the Teich Miller group. Uh, in the time Miller space. Uh, so this is the orbit. Um, we'll see why uh, Misha Verbitsky um, defined ergodicity uh, in this way uh, on the next screen. But uh, he also classified uh, which uh, complex structures are ergodic. So um, complex structures in the time Miller space uh, corresponds to um, positive oriented two planes inside of uh, the real uh, space uh, R uh, of dimension B2, where B2 is the second Betty number. And uh, I is ergodic if and only if this correspond uh, corresponding positive uh, two plane doesn't have any rational vectors. So uh, once I get to the next slide, we'll see. Uh, more clearly uh, why, uh, uh, why we have this uh, ergodicity um, definition. So uh, by uh, the global um, Torelli theorem for hypercalar manifolds, which is very similar to the global Torelli theorem for K3 surfaces, uh, one can identify uh, the time Miller space uh, where we have to take um, the time Miller space up to birational correspondence. Uh, and then you take uh, connected component. Uh, this uh, becomes um, quotient of two non-compact uh, Lie groups. Uh, so this is the period uh, domain. It can be identified as the quotient of SO3, uh, uh, B2 minus 3, modulo the product of SO2 uh, times SO1, uh, B2 minus 3. So uh, this is a quotient of two non-compact uh, Lie groups. And uh, then the mapping class group, um, there is an induced action on the period uh, domain. And it turns out that this action is ergodic uh, with respect to the Haar measure um, on this quotient of uh, Lie groups. Uh, what does ergodic uh, action mean? It means that if you take um, any subset uh, in this period um, domain, uh, which is uh, gamma invariant and measurable with respect to the Haar measure, then its measure is either zero or maximal, uh, maximal measure, which means that the complement has measure uh, zero. So um, <clears throat> this is a godic uh, action uh, in terms of uh, uh, Galvin Moore's uh, definitions and theorems. So we can uh, apply um, all the results by Ratner and Moore and uh, basically uh, translate um, ergodic actions on the period to uh, ergodic actions on the type Miller space of uh, complex structures. So this is very classical uh, algebraic uh, or even uh, in dynamical systems, you have ergodicity. So um, it's very interesting that this ergodic action uh, also applies to hypercalar geometry. <clears throat> okay, so this is the idea behind the uh, ergodicity. And uh, so we have the, <clears throat> the following <coughs> key proposition. Uh, let's take um, a complex manifold with uh, one complex structure uh, whose uh, Kobayashi pseudometric vanishes. 
And uh, let's take um, ergodic uh, complex structure in the same uh, deformation class as uh, the given one. Then uh, the Kobayashi situ metric for the uh, ergodic complex structure um, also vanishes. And the idea um, comes from uh, analysis uh, from some results of SU, uh, which say that uh, if you take, um, uh, let's take a compact complex manifold. Uh, so then uh, if you take the diameter, uh, which is a function uh, with values in the positive or the non-negative uh, real space, uh, then the maximal, um, that's the maximal distance between two points. And uh, then Seuss results say that this is uh, upper semi-continuous. <clears throat> so uh, it means that in the limit, it can jump up uh, or stay the same, uh, or stay uh, the way you think about continuous functions. Uh, so then what happens is uh, if you take an ergodic complex structure, uh, then uh, the diameter by definition is uh, non-negative. It can be zero, but it's non-negative. And then uh, in the limit, which uh, describes any other complex structure in this deformation class, the diameter can jump up. So the diameter of I, which is the ergodic, is less ridicule than the diameter of J. But by assumption, the diameter of J was already zero, so then the diameter of the ergodic um, complex structure must also be zero. So uh, then um, if you have an ergodic uh, complex structure, deformation equivalent to the given one, uh, then the Kobayashi pseudo metric uh, must vanish uh, as well. <laughs> this is the very trivial uh, observation, but um, it's actually very, very useful. Uh, for the proof of our uh, theorems. So uh, let's go back to the theorems. <clears throat> and uh, if you have a K3 surface, uh, then <clears throat> the first theorem was that if you have any K3 surface, then the Kobayashi pseudo distance is zero. So uh, let's uh, do it in two cases. Uh, the first case is if you have a maximal uh, Picard rank then uh, by various criteria, uh, then the k surface is projective. And then we're in the case of uh, Mori and Mukai, uh, where the Kobayashi pseudo distance uh, vanishes. So then in the second case, uh, when the uh, Picard rank is less than maximal, uh, then basically you're in the case of uh, ergodic uh, complex structures. And uh, because any two K3 uh, surfaces are the formation equivalent to each other, <laughs> uh, then you can deform um, your uh, given K3 um, surface to a projective one. Uh, but then from the first case, you already know that the projective one has vanishing uh, Kobayashi pseudo distance. And then because this one is uh, ergodic, uh, then by the key proposition that we just proved, um, you have vanishing of the Kobayashi pseudo metric uh, also in the ergodic case. <laughs> there is one intermediate case. Um, there is a third kind of orbit uh, by the classification of the uh, orbits of Verbitsky, but it behaves very similar to the ergodic case. So um, the proof is the same. So uh, this uh, deals with uh, both cases of maximal Picard rank and uh, non-maximal Picard rank. You can think of the ergodic structures uh, basically as having um, non-maximal uh, Picard rank. That's uh, easier characterization. <laughs> okay, so now for the other uh, theorems, uh, we'll uh, need the following uh, key theorem. Uh, if, you uh, if you have a hyperkähler manifold with two different Lagrangian vibrations, uh, which means that they're associated to non-proportional NEF uh, classes, then uh, the Kobayashi pseudo distance uh, vanishes. 
So uh, the proof of this uh, theorem is very uh, similar to what we were doing for the projective case phase surfaces. <clears throat> so uh, because uh, if you have, uh, if you can prove that uh, the general fibers of these two Lagrangian vibrations intersect, then uh, you can connect uh, any two points on M uh, by a fiber of the first Lagrangian vibration and then a fiber of the second Lagrangian vibration. So then um, you have the distance between the first point and the intersection of the fiber is zero. Then the distance between the second point and the intersection of the fibers is zero. So then by the triangle inequality, the distance between any two points is uh, zero. But first you have to prove that uh, two general fibers uh, intersect. And uh, this is done by uh, the Fujiki, uh, uh, Bogmov Fujiki formula. So uh, basically you have the setup, you have two different vibrations from the given hyperkeller to, diff to two different uh, CPNs. Uh, these are the two bases. And then you take uh, two ample classes on the two different uh, CPNs, pull them back, and then you get uh, classes alpha 1 and alpha 2. And then one can um, see that the general fiber uh, of the first vibration is just the first class uh, when, when you self-intersect it n times. Um, let's take, uh, let's say you have a uh, uh, not any ample class, but let's take the hyperplane uh, section. Then this coefficient will be one here. <laughs> and then the second fiber, uh, the second vibration, the general fiber will be uh, this pullback uh, of alpha two n times. So in this case, the self-intersection of the two fibers will be uh, given by this formula which by Fujiki, um, you have some positive constant C times uh, the bouville bogomola form between alpha one and alpha two to the N. And that's non-zero, it's actually positive, uh, which is even better. Um, uh, so um, I should say that's positive. And then uh, the general fiber of the first vibration intersects uh, the general fiber of the second vibration. And then uh, you connect uh, arbitrary pairs of points using the two uh, vibration structures. And then you get vanishing uh, of the Kobayashi pseudometric. Okay, so this was uh, the key theorem uh, about double vibrations. So uh, now let's go back to proving um, the geometric uh, theorems. Uh, if you have a hyperkeller, with uh, Picard rank less than maximal, <coughs> and which is the formation equivalent to one single Lagrangian vibration, then uh, the Kobayashi pseudo distance uh, vanishes. Well, uh, the idea behind this theorem is that uh, once you consider the <coughs> uh, moduli space of uh, complex structures or the Teichmuller space, and then inside, uh, you look at the locus of uh, given by Lagrangian vibrations. Uh, this locus uh, self-intersects. So in the self-intersection, you don't necessarily get two uh, Lagrangian vibrations. You may get two uh, birational Lagrangian vibrations. Uh, but uh, the good thing about the Kobayashi civil distance is that uh, is determined uh, modulo uh, locus of co-dimension two. So for uh, Calabia manifolds and hyperkeller manifolds, even if you have a birational Lagrangian vibration, uh, it is um, determined, um, it is Lagrangian vibration up to uh, a locus of co-dimension two, but this um, <coughs> doesn't affect the Kobayashi pseudo distance. So uh, what happens is uh, deform uh, your given Lagrangian vibration uh, to possibly uh, two birational uh, Lagrangian vibrations, which are different. 
and then use uh, the theorem about double Lagrangian vibrations. Well, um, then in this deformation, the pseudo distance will be zero, but because we're in the case of uh, less than maximal Picard rank, uh, this was basically the ergodic case. And then we can use the key proposition that if you have ergodic complex structure in the same deformation class as a complex structure with vanishing Kobayashi pseudometric, then uh, the Kobayashi pseudometric associated to the ergodic complex structure uh, also vanishes. This was by the upper semi-continuity uh, of the diameter. <clears throat> so this is the main idea uh, behind the case of non-maximal um, Picard rank. And then what happens in the case of maximal Picard rank? Then uh, we have to assume something stronger than just having a uh, Lagrangian vibration. Uh, you have to assume that uh, the SYZ conjecture holds for all uh, deformations of this hyperkeller. So, uh, and then the conclusion is the same. The Kobayashi pseudo distance is uh, trivial, <laughs> is zero. Well, uh, this uh, proof is a little bit more algebraic uh, in terms of lattice theory. Uh, remember, we, we assume that the second Betty number is at least uh, seven, which means that the Picard rank is at least five. So then uh, there exists an element uh, in the Picard uh, group of N, uh, which is uh, with self-intersection uh, zero, uh, and itself is not zero. Uh, this is by uh, Meyer's theorem for indefinite lattices, a uh, frank uh, at least five. <laughs> Because if you have a hyperkeller manifold, then uh, its Picard rank, uh, so its Picard group is um, a lattice um, of type one and then uh, rho minus one. This is intrinsic uh, property for hyperkeller manifolds. So then it's indefinite. Uh, the rank is at least five. So then you, you get the vector with self intersection uh, zero. So, but then uh, you can deform this uh, hyperkeller a little bit uh, to make uh, the corresponding uh, vector nef. And so the SYZ conjecture uh, says that um, uh, this vector with self-intersection zero uh, gives rise to a Lagrangian vibration. But then uh, by Ogisus, uh, Kenji Ogisus description of the automorphism group of the uh, Picard uh, group of M, um, <clears throat> there, is a, uh, there is a second vector uh, such that it is an image of some automorphism uh, of the given vector, which is non-proportional to Z. In this way, we can get a second uh, Lagrangian vibration. Um, so this is basically a description of the automorphisms of the Picard group. Um, and once you get a second Lagrangian vibration, uh, you apply the theorem that we already proved about um, double vibrations. Okay, so these were uh, the theorems having to do with uh, Kobayashi uh, pseudo distance uh, being zero. And now for the algebraic case, uh, remember we have um, <clears throat> that algebraic hyperbolicity uh, is a stronger result than uh, <clears throat> Kobayashi non-hyperbolicity. So then uh, for this case, we assume that either the Picard rank is strictly uh, greater than two or the Picard rank is two and the SYZ conjecture uh, holds. Then the conclusion is that M is algebraically uh, non-hyperbolic. Uh, this is the theorem together with uh, Misha Verbitsky. Uh, I forgot to write this down, but uh, this should be with uh, Verbitsky. So uh, here's the idea behind the proof. Uh, let's assume first that the Picard rank is uh, greater than two. <clears throat> and now, in every case, we have to uh, consider uh, two subcases. So uh, the Keller cone 
uh, is the subcon of the positive cone. Uh, exactly like in the case of uh, K3 surfaces, uh, the positive cone has uh, various chambers. You have the Kähler chamber, and then with automorphisms or, or reflections, uh, you can get from one chamber to another chamber by basically translating the Keller chamber around. So, uh, but if there is only one uh, chamber, uh, in other words, if the Keller cone coincides with a positive cone, uh, then by results of uh, Ugiso about uh, automorphisms, uh, the automorphism group of M is commensurable with the group of isometries um, on the second cohomology group, uh, preserving the Hoche type. So um, <clears throat> the part which comes from H20 and H02 uh, is actually finite. So we are interested uh, uh, mostly in the part that comes from H11. So uh, the part that comes from the automorphisms of H11 uh, can be seen to be infinite. Uh, because uh, by Borel and Harishchandra's theorem, uh, if you have that rho is strictly uh, bigger than 2, then any arithmetic subgroup of SO1, uh, comma rho minus 1 is a lattice. And then, uh, then you apply Borel's uh, density theorem, uh, which implies that any lattice in a non compact uh, simple Lie group is a risky dense. So um, we don't really need the density, but we just need that uh, SO, um, the auto automorphism group of uh, iso isometries uh, is infinite. Well then, um, if this part is infinite, then the automorphism group of M, which uh, is the same measure as uh, this one, is also infinite. <laughs> well, in the case of infinite automorphism group, uh, we can apply the theorem with uh, Fedya Bogomolov, uh, and then uh, we see that uh, M is uh, algebraically non hyperbolic. <coughs> okay, so this takes care of the case when the Keller cone coincides with a positive cone. And then uh, the other subcase is actually easier. If uh, the killer cone doesn't coincide with a positive cone, then uh, just like the case in K3 surfaces, uh, the walls of the killer cone and that, um, of the various chambers are determined by rational curves. So uh, the same is true in the hyperkeller case. So if the killer cone doesn't coincide with a positive cone, then there exists a rational curve on the manifold and then it's automatically um, algebraically non-hyperbolic. <laughs> and so this uh, exhausts uh, the possibilities of the case when the Picard rank is bigger than two. So now for the case when, when the Picard rank is precisely two, uh, let's do this case first because it's uh, identical to case 1.2. If the positive and the Keller cones are different, then again, uh, the hyperkeller contains a rational curve and it is uh, algebraically non hyperbolic. So then, the only case that's left is uh, when rho is 2 and uh, the Keller cone and the positive cones uh, coincide. Well, then, uh, this is basically a simple problem on lattice theory because you know uh, precisely the type of this lattice. Uh, it is of type 1-1. Uh, 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 and uh, there is a classification. So for example, um, if you open some books on lattice theory, uh, you can find the following proposition. Uh, if there is no element in H11 of NZ, um, with self-intersection zero, then uh, the, uh, out the group of isometries is isomorphic to Z cross uh, Z2. But this is an infinite group. So both uh, the group of isometries 
uh, and the automorphism group of M are infinite. And then we apply this uh, theorem with Fedya Bogomolov and Misha Verbitsky. Uh, and then on the other hand, uh, if there exists an element uh, in the Picard group with uh, self-intersection zero, uh, since we assume that the SYZ conjecture holds, uh, then uh, it implies that there exists a uh, vibration, Lagrangian vibration on M, and then uh, some fiber is uh, non-hyperbolic, and therefore uh, there exists some rational curve on M, and um, uh, again, M is algebraically uh, non-hyperbolic. So with this, uh, we exhaust uh, all of the possible cases. And then uh, we've also proved that if you have a uh, hypercalar manifold with the car rank either greater than two or uh, two plus you assume the SYZ conjecture, then M is uh, algebraically uh, non-hyperbolic. Okay, and this was the last slide of my uh, talk. So thank you very much again for uh, inviting me. Okay, we should thank you and not you us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that we all enjoy very much the talk. If you have any questions or comment, please. No need to raise hand, you can simply ask. Of course, switch on the microphone and also the camera when you ask the question. Or you have comments. No comments? I cannot see any comments and any remarks. So I guess thank you once again. Thank you. I hope I wasn't going too fast. And the next meeting will be the next Friday. Uh, and the speaker should be uh, Andreas Weiermann from Ghent, uh, from Belgium, but uh, he's still uh, 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 has not confirmed the talk, but in any case, next Friday we will have a talk. And um, if not Weierman, there will be somebody else and it will be clear till Monday. Uh, and now you can go back to Bulgarian. 